Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to 2020 Spring LCK. I'm Atlas. I'm joined by LS and KT have just upset the big dogs in Gen G in game number one of our Gen G and KT's final game of the regular season. And uh, yes, you might be saying that, look, KT aren't playing for anything right now, but Gen G, they need to win this if they're going to take the top spot in the LCK. Yeah, they need to bounce back in this game and try to take this down because game number one couldn't have been feeling too comfortable, especially not if you're Rascal. So he's going to need to make sure that he comes into game number two, doesn't let game number one get to him, and then try to bounce back. This time, KT might not be that surprised, at least not by any sort of counter picks or matchups like that, like the Belkaz coming out. They're going to be on the blue side. So Genji is going to be the one to perhaps have more control over what picks they're going to take, what sort of edges they can find inside of the draft phase, and see what they can do with that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. As uh, it is going to be someone that picks up the player of the game. If this isn't 100% uh, of the votes, I will eat my hat. I don't have a hat. That's just how confident I am. I'm going to buy you one. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> All right, well, take a look at some of the highlights here. The Jay's just always dealing pretty much free damage onto the opponents. He did have to reposition right there briefly because of the Azir Sand Soldier. He's trying to give him a big old hug. And ends up sniping with the Shock Blast right there inside of this team fight. Pay attention to him on the left hand side. As he was just cleanup crew. He was the janitor in this team fight. Love it. Hammer smash down onto the Silas, and I really like how they gave it to him. With a hammer to the face, no doubt. Yeah. M misses the shock blast, but the rest of his team know that they're not supposed to be stealing away a pentakill, and that is just called synergy right there for this squad. So really good to see uh, here from Soan and from KT as their final match of the regular season. Uh, comes to a close potentially in this game number two, but they still need to keep themselves together and Genji are a team that can bounce back after losses. And I'm just hoping that we're going to see a different side of Rascal and one that is... Uh... What? Okay, so it's a top lane substitution, but it's for KT. Uh... Okay. Uh... Um... So I would have thought that he would feel really... Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> this is such an important match for them. And you know what? Maybe that means that they have something planned. Again, they're moving. Now, the, 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 the peculiar thing about this is they're moving to the blue side. So if there was some sort of like special picks or something, it would probably be better to use them on red side rather than blue so that you can really make sure that they slot in without being able to be answerable. So... I'm really curious what this could possibly mean. Kellen coming out, life going in. So this is very strange, Atlas. If there if there would have been any substitutions going on, I wouldn't have expected any to be coming out on the side of KT. But they're the ones with more subs. Yeah, and... they're also they're also the team that are locked in their particular position. They're not going to be moving from fourth. So you could understand that they're just saying, well, I mean this doesn't necessarily mean too much. We may as well get as much experience to our players as possible. But, yeah, uh, but I don't know whether I like it that much. If you're um, DRX yeah. or T1, you don't feel that good about that. Yeah. Because there is still a lot riding on the line for those two teams. And so I believe that, uh, well, I mean, I, I can understand that that's totally the mindset, right? Try to get your players as much experience because it doesn't change the standing for themselves. But... When the result of the match can change the standing for others, you still want to try to do your best. So maybe they have something in store, and we're just undercutting them before the game even starts. So we'll have to just see. Yeah, and we have to remember that Genji actually don't give up possibility of first place if they win 2-1. They're too far ahead in points, so it doesn't actually matter whether they win 2-1 or 2-0 in this particular match. So in theory, uh, now if Genji just win the next two games then we're still back to exactly the same uh, trajectory as we were uh, before game number one. So 
It's a, it's a really interesting scenario, but I just don't see how subbing in Ray and Mulrung is ever going to be a good idea. Uh, because they've proven that they haven't been able to do too much winning uh, so far this season. If we have a look at Mulrung's stats, he's currently 0% win rate on everything. It's yep. just uh, he's lost every game. Uh, well. Ray has won a couple, um, but that was, of course, with Bono there in the jungle. So uh, look to see what KT actually have planned here. It might be a 10-7 exclusive, um, but we'll just see. Not enough really has changed to, to warrant, you know, subbing out top and jungle just to, to try something crazy. So we'll just have to see. Uh, KT oh. now on the blue side. We'll be banning away the Zoe from B to D. And uh, there is the Trundle. Even though it's Malrong, they're still going to be banning that one away. Well, one of the things that I do want to highlight is that very early on and throughout the middle of the split, Ray was one of the few Korean pro players actually spamming a lot of the non-conventional champions. So, I'm curious to see if we're going to get something of that in tonight's match here, in game number two. As right now, the bans, they're pretty standard. For the most part, Genji with the Senna and the Trundle. We'll see if Aphilios or Callista ends up biting the dust. And neither, actually. They're going to try to just weaken the Callista by removing the Tarek. And KT say, okay, we'll choose Aphilios. And I think Aphilios B1, I, I've, I've spoke about this a lot recently. I think he is vulnerable. You can, you can control him with long-range mages or even mages in the bot lane are really valuable against him. Especially because his support's going to happen to come in blind. You can get a lot of edge in that regard. Champions from the mid lane, like Azir, Orianna, and whatnot, they really control fights against him very well. Genji, though, they're hovering set for Rascal. Yeah, once again, that's going to be locked away. I think this is dangerous, as Callista is going to be picked up. This could be the bottom lane, actually. We could see Ruler and Life on the Callista set. Set does work quite well with the Fate's Call uh, above him. But uh, we'll just have to find out as this uh, as this draft keeps going. I would I wouldn't be surprised if we just see KT lock away at Braum. I think Tucson had a great game on it last time around. As Malrung back to his old habits here on the Jarvan, and he's going to lock that one away. And now KT, do they take a solo laner here, or do they try to shore up this bottom lane and give nothing away? And I assume that that is going to be where their heads are going to be at. Jarvan, and oh man, what the old favorite? I this could be it. Lock it in. No, nah, nah not happening. You lost uh, me. I'll be the see you later, Alice. I'll be back for <laughs> series two. I think it's a little bit too dangerous to pick Soraka at that point because you know they could flex the set anywhere and then yes. uh, crush the Soraka on the top side of the map. They could even put Rascal on the Callista potentially, and that would still be a bad time. So uh, I don't mind pivoting uh, for a little bit more safety in the draft. Is now cleared, going to be heading towards his wreck side by the looks of things. Let's try and farm up the early game, and are uh, pretty stable there as far as Genji's pickups are concerned. We'll, well see where the bands are going to be heading because there's a fair bit of flexibility here on Genji's side. So KT going to have a bit of a rough ask for what they want to be banning away, and it might just be that they look to the mid lane and try to stop BDD from getting on anything that he really wants to be. Uh, up to. All of Genji's champions right now are very melee and heavy focus on the engage. Zillion getting banned away now by Genji, even though they would have the counter pick available. So if they do, may maybe they want to retain set as mid top support flex yeah. as it currently stands. And so perhaps they don't want to actually just pick support on R4 and they want to pick another flex champion so that they can contain whether or not set or, or what lane set is going to as Rakan gets banned away. Yeah, that's an interesting ban. Of course, uh, yeah. life has a lifetime, very, very high win rate on the Rakan. And we did see, I think it was a life and ruler that debuted uh, Callista Rakan. Uh, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong there, but it did make its debut in the LCK for 2020 spring uh, last week and was working out pretty well. Um, I'm having a look at uh, Ray's solo queue um, just recently. He's uh, won a hell of a lot of games, and he's been playing a lot of different things. I mean, he's 7-1 and one on Maokai, for example, which is uh, quite interesting. 
We'll see whether that means that that's going to be coming out here as Rascal thinking about the Orn, and that is going to be locked away. Okay. Still, the Orn is flexing everywhere. So we don't necessarily know yet exactly where things are going on Genji's side. I like the draft so far. So I still think that this means, I mean, Soraka could come in because she's able to be flexed mid and top at this point. With the set and the Orn, as long as she finds the Orn, she could easily make her appearance in this series. As right now, Galio is being hovered and there's a, a boatload of physical damage on the side of Genji. So Galio's new shield, not gonna really have that much influence as it does currently stand. But Galio Jarvan is a combo. And KT are really just trying to fight this Gen G team composition head on. But yeah. when you look at it, Orn Callista set really good at brawling. Uh, that's a Shen. That's a Shen. Okay. Well, that's fun. Um, according to what Ray has been playing in solo queue, it has not been Shen, but that's only on his main account. And so who knows where things are going to be going here is uh, that is a Silas being considered at the moment. Heroic Entrance, pretty powerful as an ability. And also Silas was seen as a great counter to Shen just because he can steal away the Stand United and then yep. go wherever you want on the map, especially for a solo lane Silas. It is uh, very, very strong. Um, means you can take whichever summoner spells you like and things like that. And but, so I uh, think that they they picked the, the Shen because Shen initially when, when Set came out and when Set started getting his, his small mer nerfs, a lot of Koreans actually thought Shen countered Set inside of the laning phase, and then with this wombo combo type of a team composition, having the the semi-global from Galio, there's a lot of influence down in the bot lane, and Shen, he's gotten a lot of indirect help lately in the game, and I think that he's, he's well positioned to come back inside of the meta. They're actually planting the Silas against the Galio, and Shen against Orr which is not what I was expecting to see because Silas, you steal away the Stand United as Shen channels his, and then you follow Shen. Which yeah, exactly. Which is one of the things that you can do on the Silas. Maybe they'll swap in game, but this is, a, this is clearly intentional, KT's team composition. This is a comp that they were probably wanting to play almost regardless of what Genji picked. And it just so happens that this is pretty dicey. It, I, I would. We, we got some action and, and some yeah. sparks. They're gonna fly early, Alice. I actually really like it. Both of these teams want to team fight from mid game to late game, right? Like both of these teams have very similar ideas uh, with what they want to be getting done. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing who can actually get control in these team fights because honestly, at the moment. My thought is that KT should be able to take it because they have been the more consistent team as far as being able to stay on the same page and get that coordination down. But we'll see whether Genji now, with a slight change to their roster with life coming in over Kellen, are going to be able to get themselves in line because this is a composition that also needs to be played with some finesse as the game goes on. We'll see what does end up happening here as KT and Genji load in here. Game number two, Shen has grasped the Undying up there in top lane. He's going to be able to proc it a lot against the Orn. Orn's going to be able to get a lot of value out of that as well. And now, yeah. with the Orn, it came in on R4. Silas followed up on R5. That is actually a bit of magic damage. So Galio's ultimate can get some value with the new change, depending on how the team fight ends up going. So a little bit of a nice Many upside there as awesome. well. And both Aphilios and Callista, they really do enjoy both of these team compositions. Both AD carries can have a lot of value. Yeah, and a lot of protection. This is all about peeling for ruler and aiming. So it's about which AD carry is going to be able to get himself ahead and uh, which one is going to fall behind. And aiming is on his Aphilios. We have to remember back to when Aphilios was first released and who was able to really find those incredible games on him. And it was aiming for the most part that was able to do uh, the most work on this champion, uh, be it in the LCK or in Casper Cup uh, when he was first uh, debuting. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he can get done already. Trade's working out relatively well for the Shen up towards the top side as Malrung in classic Malrung style is here for a level two gank. Oh, there he is. things sometimes just don't change. Good stun gonna land here on the bottom side though as now life is in trouble. Haymaker comes out, fair bit of damage there as aiming has been ignited to start this one off, but Malrong already successful in his level two gank. Yep. 
So some things never change, Alice. Yeah. Balrog back to sinning at the very start of this game. We take a look at the runes all across the board. There's actually a lot of demolish, even in lanes where realistically the champion shouldn't be able to get onto the turret. And also celerity on the Galio, but there, there's nothing to really bolster his movement speed outside of the teleport. So a little surprising right there. Would have thought uh, he would utilize a, an entirely different room. Um, it's one of those interesting things that we see. We take a look at the replay here. Malrong he comes down, he flashes forward, and I think that was to try to get a reaction flash out of life, and then he could immediately follow with flag and drag. But yeah, he actually didn't flag and drag at all, as we've got a flash base breaker coming in here as cleared. Coming down, level three, level two for Malrong, but he is here. Double teleports oh. coming in as well, as there's the flash from Tuz, and they're trying to dive onto Clint, who's going to flash towards Kuro, but he's looking to try and get out of there, and he's not going to be able to. Aiming's going to go down as well, so double kill already. The Orn picks up one. Five members on the bottom side of the map for Gen G, and they wipe the floor with KT. Yeah, so I said that we were going to get some fireworks. I was not anticipating it to be this early on. And this time around, KT are falling pretty far behind very early on. This is two kills onto the Silas, the Galio. He goes down there, he's also picking up double Doron's ring as he returns towards the lane. Let's take a look at how this all transpires. Aiming and Tujin couldn't get the crash, and then Genji initiating the trade. Take a look at the top side of the map. The Orn already crashed in the wave. He's teleporting down first, and then Clid manages to break vision ever so slightly. Kuro his AP was just absent as soon as he ended up arriving. And Clid able to lock up Ray as well, had the flash available. Not gonna be able to do anything. Life ends up taking a turret shot, doesn't matter, the Haymaker absorbs it all. And as we resume into lot, I mean, top lane is just, it's over. Yeah, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit sad about this, right? Because I wanted to actually have a good idea of how this uh, Shen versus Orn matchup is gonna go here on the competitive stage, but now the lane's done. And so we're not going to really get that information. So a little bit unfortunate, but that is okay. It's good to see Genji back to a bit of form. And also Rascal coming in there and being able to actually find an effective uh, bottom lane teleport, showing that uh, Genji may have uh, fixed up some of their issues from game number one and their previous series. As uh, Rascal certainly with a pretty good win rate so far on the Orn has only recently started losing some matches. As we have a look at when Ray last played, it was versus Sandbox and it was a loss and he was playing the Aatrox. Well, so far here in this game, he is getting bodied up in top lane by Rascal. And it's gonna be Sunfire Cape, it seems, as the first item for him. He might actually just sit on the bombies and then proceed going into the Abyssal Mask. I think that's another option that he could go for as well. He wants more sustain. It's been 56 days until Malra, or 56 days since Malrong's last game. It was versus APK. Ended up losing on it. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of been the tale of uh, this top laner and mid lane and, and jungle combo. Uh, it felt like KT really did find their optimal starting roster. Um, but very strange that they've subbed them out during this game. So far, it's not all over just yet, as he's got Malrung making his way in, but he's going to wander over a ward, now starting a back, understanding that I believe KT were aware of this ward's positioning, as Malrung does just cancel it, and uh, life just hex flashing around, seeing what he can get done, as Gen G are just going to take this Mountain Drake, which is the first Drake of the game, and Rascals are moving on down to the mid lane, just to help uh, BDD get some extra vision. So far, pretty cool, calm, and collected, and uh, working out relatively well here for Genji. As the dragon is going to fall, next one is going to be the Infernal, and then of course we get Cloud Soul, because uh, that's just <laughs> that's how it goes. Well, Ray is trying his best to get back into this lane up here, and even foregoing, picking up some of the CS to trade with the Orn. Definitely an interesting decision. Okay. Yeah, double face breaker comes down as aiming. He's going to get haymade as well. As uh, he does make it underneath that turret, he's going to be all right for now. Does get the reactivation of the Gravitum, but uh, not going to be able to capitalize on any of that CC. As Clid is in position, Kuro is making his way down, but you can see this ward is going to get all of the information that our Genji needed, and they're not going to go for any dives or anything like that. Playing around this bottom side is interesting, though. 
uh, because there's not too much to gather now that the Infernal Drake is going to be spawning in another four minutes' time. Looks to be Shelly that's going to be next. Cab off the rank as far as these global objectives are concerned, and we'll see who's going to move over there first and uh, what KT are going to plan on doing to get themselves back into this game. And it does seem like things are going to be a little bit rough. Now, obviously, we are waiting for the Stand United players to start coming in with the Galio as well as the Darwin trying to set things up. So it's not like KT are out of this game yet by any means. Second Dragon of the game, another Infernal Dragon. So will we end up seeing the Cloud Soul this game, Atlas? I, I'm not so sure if that's I've already be... said it. It's already happening. It's guaranteed. There is a Cloud Drake this game. And uh, if it isn't, then I have opposite caster cursed it, and that is totally fine. That's totally um, fine. But if it is, yeah. we just knew that it was happening. So. It's just one of those things. It's one of those things that we just have to prepare prepare for. As our 1500 gold is now the lead for Gen.G. And uh, it looks like it's just extending as this game goes on. It looks like Gen.G are able to just play this one out very cool and uh, get themselves the advantages where they need to. As uh, they are a team that's very good at playing with leads. And let's see how clean it's going to be uh, closing out this game as well. Aiming, finally looking to get maybe his first turret plate of the game. Not going to be able to just yet, as you can see Malrong looking for something to do as well. Callista going to respect the fact that Malrong's coming down. And meanwhile, Clid, looking like he might just actually plant the Rift Herald up there in top lane. And yeah, there are like that's going down yeah, bot so... side, but yeah, Ray oh, is in this lane right now. This tower plate's coming in. Good knockoff is going to come forward. It's the double, actually, is now Ray trying to keep himself alive. The Void Rush comes out. Ray is going to keep himself alive for a moment longer, but not able to survive as the Ram is going to take him down. And I don't see how he was ever supposed to survive in that situation. Maybe a little bit greedy sticking around for too long. Well, Genji are looking like they're just going to actually sweep up this game with relative ease because the Shen is just light years behind of the Orn in this game. Orn's getting a completely free game. Rek'Sai really far ahead of the Jarvan as well. And, the, I mean, the solo laners are doing just completely fine. So the Silas gets to steal away the Stand United later on. The Galio not going to have any usage in the early stages because this game's been accelerated so fast. So that really takes away some of the power that KT should have been able to have in a stalled and, and stagnated early laning phase to make use of Stand United plus the Galio ultimate and really cause chaos on the bottom side. It's just not possible anymore. So in the replay, they use the Rift Herald, three turret plates remaining, ends up going down, and it is really just all she wrote. They executed this really well coordination on the dive. Ray, no chance to really live there. Galio not in close proximity for an ult. Things are just looking doomed. Yeah, and also, I felt like Ray just held on to every single one of his buttons. Didn't really have anything there. Didn't even put up a dodge field or anything like that, which is a very high usage against the, the Rek'Sai, but couldn't get it down before the knockups started raining through and uh, was unable to survive. So maybe next time he's going to be feeling in a better standing. But uh, right now, it's looking real dicey here for the Shen player as Rascal comes back over, clears out that wave very, very quickly, and he's going to go back into the Fog of War uh, to see what he can threaten next. Uh, 30 seconds on the Infernal Drake, like we were talking about, as Marong is going to get a little bit of extra damage there onto life. Naming down here, just seeing what else he can do as Clid finds the Prey Seeker. As uh, Kuro not able to actually get on over to help out the rest of his team, it looks like Genji should be able to just walk over to this Drake and take it, utilizing all of their early advantages that they've managed to pick up in order to bully KT out of this. And cleared over to the side, Malrung is here, and they do not want to give this up without a fight by the looks of things as Ruler dancing on over, knock up, not going to land there onto Malrung as all of Genji prepared to take down this dragon. Well. Genji are all postured around it right now. Shen trying to do his best to recover in the CS department. Also on Tiamat, first sight of Genji. It looks like there's actually not even going to be any contests over the strike. And Ocean's Atlas, oh my thank you God, it for happened. saving us. You're welcome. You're welcome. Sometimes cast curse is necessary to, in order to get the, the right uh, dragons on this map. A tower plate does go over to Ray. He's going to head back home with a 20 CS deficit. 
and missing out on a couple of the kills that Rascal has. I think this is going to be, if we have a look at the gold eventually, a huge lead for Rascal. He's in a great spot on this Ornn right now. As our Barmy Cinder now completed for Raze, just making sure that he can clear out minions as fast as he possibly can in order to get as much pressure on this map as, as humanly possible. But this is such bad news for KT. I mean, if it was a Cloud Soul, then maybe KT can just let the rest of these Drakes go and not worry about it too much. But now, the fact that it's an Ocean Drake, like, Ocean Soul is something that they will have to fight for as this game goes on. So it means that pressure is definitely on KT. This core is going to take yet another turret plate, but life is here. Rascal turning up as well, and there's the face breaker. Crow going to get boots back. He's pretty tanky, but he's never going to survive this. Holds onto his flash the entire time, and a little bit of greed there for the mid laner of KT is aiming. Sets himself up to take down some more plates here on the bottom side, and will get himself at least one more, but I don't think that's worth the life of his gargoyle. And at the end of it all, the gold advantage is about 2,000 in Genji's favor as Orin is massive. He is a super Walmart on wheels, as oh, yeah. 3 0 and 2, 119 CS. Gonna be able to complete both of his ornaments and get them online really fast here in this game. And we'll see what kind of ornaments are actually gonna be upgraded here, as BDD, it's not that Death Cap is always, or never built on Silas, there's definitely possibilities to get it, but Obviously, Luden's Pulse and Zanya's Paradox probably more likely to be upgraded. The Sidian Cleaver on the Rek'Sai, Might of the Rune King on the Callista. So, take a look at Kuro. He was really greeting for the two turret plates, which does equate to a kill. Marong in close proximity, but not going to be able to do anything. He ends up dying, also, and like you were saying, way too much greed. Yeah, I don't, I don't think he managed to get the second turret plate as well. It did go down, but I don't think it was enough there as aiming. Onslaught now activates, and our Ruler and Life unable to actually pressure him at all. Looks like Hail of Blades activated by the Omni Stone there for life, as you can see, but I'm not able to actually get in there and try anything, but they also don't have to. Like, Genji can play this one as slowly as you like. As, uh, thankfully for KT, they were able to grab a fair bit of money in the turret plates, only behind by one. And uh, that's certainly good news, but you can see it doesn't actually matter. Five to one is the kill score. Two Drakes going over to Gen G, and they also have a 3,000 gold lead moving in two minutes' time towards uh, Soul Point being available for this Gen G squad. This is a much better game from this team, and certainly a look from a team that is uh, poised for first place. And uh, thankfully, they look like that squad right now. Well, my uh, my stream did freeze. Now, oh no! I am, well, at uh, least something can freeze here in the LCK. Currently stuck about 30 seconds ago. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that the camera is probably panning across various screens and we're playing ping pong. Yeah. All right. You are definitely the only one freezing, LS. Don't you worry. <laughs> uh, it's, um, that's how that one goes. As uh, KT, they're ping pong on the bottom side, uh, doing it a little bit more reserved as they're worried about just getting killed. And uh, it looks like they're putting all of their eggs into the aiming basket once again. As uh, Infernum now picked up, Genji will move over and grab Shirley. And uh, it feels like Shelly and Shirley both on the same team so far today. As I believe both of them went to KT in game number one, and now they've uh, truly moved over to who they believe is the best team in uh, Genji. As we've got the turret down, but uh, Genji not going to be too worried about uh, this turret falling at this point in time, and there's no more turret plates, so not too worried about that either as KT just move on back. There is a slight advantage in CS for aiming, and uh, that is certainly good news. He is the win condition for this KT squad, so it's not over yet. There are still win conditions here, uh, but this tower is gonna go down and the map is going to shrink ever so much more. And uh, it's just it's feeling like it's going from bad to worse, LS. All right, well, my, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to work with you here as 30 seconds until the ocean dragon is gonna come up. You can see yep. Ray up in top lane. He's trying to do his best again to just finally complete one core item. But the problem is that KT are so far behind on items that this dragon fight should almost always go the way of Gen G, especially because BDD just has access to such important ultimates for turning this fight around. And no one has an answer to Orn. So anytime KT has to go into Gen G when they're behind, Orn is gonna be enabled and be way too strong. Set is gonna be having such a good time as well. So without sort of an item lead 
to generate KT's uh, oppressive nature of their team composition, things are just going to be really rough. Yeah, and also now KT is going to give up uh, soul points. So five minutes time, they have, will have to fight against Gen G. But right now they're opting in for trading. They're going to go for this top outer turret. They're pinging on the inner as well as uh, I believe Clid was able to take down that red buff also. So the bottom of the, bottom of the map is owned by Gen G as Malrong here is towards the top side, just trying to act as cover here for KT. And uh, KT just want to get as much money into aiming as possible. And, you know, this uh, particular play certainly did that as uh, he does have the most gold on the map. And uh, as it stands right now, we're probably going to enter a lull state because you know, unless Gen G want to team fight, no fight can actually take place. There's no siege potential on the side of KT. There's no way for them to poke Gen G, and there's no way, sh certainly, for them to dive Gen G if they're ever underneath any other turrets. So, Gen G are the ones with complete autonomy inside of this game, and. Things are looking really rough because we're going to have a very similar game number one fiasco where soul points coming up on the menu. But unlike game number one, it's looking like it should just be a pretty decisive stomp in favor of Genji because KT, they're struggling to really find anything. And if they just keep playing ping pong with the side waves, never inviting a member to go out of position, they're just setting themselves up for more and more of a failure. Yeah. So far this game, Gen.G haven't made the mistake of game number one, where they were starting fights that they shouldn't be having uh, in the river when there's nothing to fight for, right? That was how KT were able to get back in against Gen.G. That was that pivotal moment. And this time around, they're just not giving KT that opportunity whatsoever. And so this gold lead is only extending as this game continues. And Morong finding himself uh, with more and more d difficulty uh, taking down these, uh, these camps in his own jungle. It's just getting a bit dicey here. Yeah, not too much really going on. As two and a half minutes are, is going to be the time remaining. And by that time, Rascal, he should be able to hit level 13, get all of his ornament upgrades. Silas should be comfortably at two items. As it looks like Galio is actually going to go for the Zanya's Hourglass as his second item. Jarvan continuing on in the tank department. Call was completed by aiming. So that yeah, that's why that... he had so much uh, yep. extra gold uh, during this game. So that's certainly yeah. good. Has himself a couple of cloaks as well. I don't know why you need two, but uh, there you go. But yeah, it's uh, it's not looking good here for KT. As Kuro's towards the bottom side, just clearing out waves. One thing that they do have is a split push comp that can then team fight very, very quickly, uh, assuming uh, the Galio's proximity to uh, the team fight, the global yeah. nature of Stand United, certainly valuable there. The problem is, is that they just... They can't get enough pressure on this map to dictate to Genji what to do. And we all know exactly where Genji is going to be. As now Rascal's in a little bit of trouble, searing charge to get himself out of here. But Malrung and Tucson thinking that he's just too tanky in order to, to bother with. And uh, he's just going to move away from this minion wave after taking down all of the minions. And uh, you can see that Ray's just going to push that one back towards him. So no harm, no foul for anyone just there. His aiming's going to move back. Does have himself a stopwatch now as well as his zeal completed. It's still a long way away from those three items that any Aphelios is looking for. Well, Genji, I mean, I, I think that this game really does... I mean, I, I think it further raises the question, right? In this game, yes, it, it did feel like it was a loss of total control with those initial teleports down in bot lane. Kuro just going to immediately push out this wave. He's, he's got a hot date to get to. So, as it stands, though, why did Malrong and Ray come in in game number two? Well, we did see... A unorthodox pick, right? We, we saw the Shen come out. He probably thought he was up against the set, did go against the Orn, lost lane control initially, fell behind in the XP department, then the teleport play happened in bot lane, and things were never really salvageable. Malrong still being true to his sinner ways with the level 2 gank and then a very low econ play style. He transitioned out of that pretty well here in this game, though, as he's managed to keep up in the CS department against Clid. Both parties, they're just going to posture for the second dragon. But if you look at the items on the side of Gen G and the fact that their team comp benefits so much more when playing on the defensive or having KT come into them, you're feeling pretty confident. Oh, yeah. This is uh, really dicey. As, uh, Rascal's moving on over, looking for an ultimate. And uh, Gen G can pull the 
They can uh, go aggressive whenever they want to, as Rascal takes a fair bit of free damage there from aiming, who does have the close range combo with the Sever and Crescendum. The Genji is going to move towards this Ocean Drake, start this one up, and remember this is Soul Point and it's going down extremely quickly. KT need to get to this pit and start a fight. Flat's already out, but the Drake's being taken, and now the Ocean Soul is going to be helping Genji. A fantastic showstopper into the back line there as Aiming's going to die, and this will be a wash for Genji. They're getting all of their health back so quickly. There are so many thumbs up here for Genji as Rascal. Yeah, he was, uh, he was slowed down at the beginning, had to flash defensively, is now BDD looking for Tucson, who just flashes himself. Oh no, <laughs> the thumbs down, <laughs> whoopsies. But it looks like BDD will be able to lock this kill down, so at least he's staying in high spirits, but uh, that is an ace. That is Genji's Baron, and this should be the game. That is absolutely gonna be the game, Atlas. As no one gets to really come back from an Ocean Drake in this kind of manner. There's no open inhibitors, there's no backdoor potential, or front door, front door potential, that is gonna be an option for KT. None of their champions can really get Grievous Wounds either, so there's no rose-tinted glasses where you look at it and you're like, well, if, if they could just take this miracle team fight at the, you know, the, the dawn of 6.07 a.m. at exactly this angle and find some sort of a victory, it's not gonna happen. This game is so far gone. Probably gonna have one more team fight. Take a look at it. Then they, they start this off with the Ocean Soul. And just look at their HP bars inside of this team fight. No one can die, pretty much. And the the end of all of this results in the Baron, another recall, so much gold in everyone's pockets, and ornaments coming in. So the right is on. We get to watch this again. Fantastic. But uh, Tucson's still going to die, and we're going to have a look at it from the perspective uh, of life. Show stop in the back. Yep. Repositioned. It's not where you want. And uh, Facebook comes out just to make sure that everyone's going to be fine. We're all are just dancing around happily, and this is largely the Ocean Soul really just having a good time in this particular team fight. And now they're saying, let's go to the Baron. Yep. And that's exactly what they did. Well, it is uh, 1 to 10, almost a 10,000 gold lead, Baron, Ocean Soul, and the other two good dragons. As Mountain and Infernal does accompany it, Luton Pulse was upgraded. Yep, for Might of the Rune King Silas. as well. Yep, Might of the Rune King, Obsidian Cleaver, gonna end up coming in next. As it looks like Set actually not gonna go for the Sunfire Cape, which I find really. Interesting, because he would get so much value out of it if he did build it this game, and having it get upgraded by Orn. But Deadman's Plate helps him with his repositioning. And Rascal, unfortunately, because of the Thorn Mail as well as the Sunfire, he can't actually hug the Shen. He will end up taking Turret Aggro. He doesn't seem to mind too much about any tur Turret He's Aggro, though. He's got a lot of farmer. He's a big boy. He does. He is certainly a big boy. Mr. Orn, not exactly going to be moved anytime soon as you got Kuro trying to defend this bottom out of turret. I don't know whether this is going to necessarily be the game winning play and he agrees. He's going to move back towards his inhibitor turret now. So base not broken just yet, but Rascal is going to pop on over, grab out his little Forgeman's hammer and take it to work. And that is going to be the first part of the base broken in quick succession. The mid inhibitor turret will also fall as now Genji get to work on inhibitors and KT they have to try and mount some sort of a de defense, but I just don't think it's possible right here. And you can see, like, we might be asking ourselves, well, they have to pull the trigger, but I mean, do they even have a trigger? It's a pop gun against a shotgun, and that's just not what you want. As Life is going to get a really good face breaker there, and face four is going to get him out. Here, heroic entrance finds no CC. As Ruler is still absolutely fine bouncing around this team fight. Searing Charge gets a knock up there on the crew, and the Justice Punch is interrupted. Silas takes down the job, and a lot of damage there from aiming, though, as he might be able to turn this. BDD going to go into his Zonyas, but the Nexus turret's being worked on. There are so many minions here, as the Nexus will be falling down. Ruler is just bouncing around the outside, celebrating as he flashes to try and get rid of aiming. Makes short work of him, and will take down this Nexus to bring this to one and one between KT and Genji. And the thing about this game is that it ended really early on. So I don't want to say that KT's team composition was a sinner team comp, but it definitely had smoke and mirrors to it that needed to get some edges early 
in order to transition into the mid and later stages of the game on somewhat even footing. The scaling on the side of Gen.G is so much bigger. And as long as they could stabilize early, they would always be in a position to win out relatively easily. And them getting the leg up in the bot lane with the five on five in bottom happening at level three was just such a clean and awesome victory for them. And they never let go of the advantages. Yeah. I actually thought it was really brilliant. I thought that the turnaround from Rascal was also fantastic. Uh, he looked much better in this game. Um, then the last one, I'm trying to work out who to give my Pog vote to. And I feel like maybe it's between Rascal and BDD for me. How about you? I am thinking that it... Ooh, this is... Uh... It's that a toughie, isn't it? it? Also, yeah, life. it feels like they all life sort of had a good game participate. Too. I'm going to just give it to Rascal, though, because I saw him freezing a wave, and then he just outplayed the Shen in the early stages of the, of the game, level waves one through three. He played it better, and I think that was actually pretty integral to the bot lane stuff, as well as the follow-up top lane problems. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think that uh, the Shen being completely worthless was largely to do with uh, Rascal being so much more value in that initial uh, teleport play also. And he was always there where, where he needed to be, and that's exactly what he wasn't able to do in their previous series and in the previous game. So I think that uh, Rascal having a turnaround was a large reason why uh, Genji were able to move so easily uh, into a victory here. But also, I mean, Ray and Malron, question mark, is still a thing. So we'll see whether KT go back to their main roster after this one because that substitution was one of the more weird ones uh, here for the LCK, especially uh, in their last match of the regular season. Well, we shall see what happens in game number three because I imagine that the main roster will come back out again. They'll be back on the red side, so hopefully they can find edges because this one was a blowout. Oh yeah. This it's, was... Uh, felt like it was over very, very quickly. Yep. And it was interesting because KT, they started it off really well, but this was Amy and Tushing really making a, a, a pretty poor decision with their lane manipulation. Everyone got called into the party in this team fight down here in bot lane. And you can see the teleports were coming in. Ray just couldn't do anything on the Shen as everyone was just trying to run away. Full on retreat for KT. This is not how early they wanted to be teleporting. They wanted level six on everyone. And this was Clid moving up to top lane to take advantage of the very vulnerable Shen. Yeah, now, I don't know where the Twilight Refuge was, unless it was just invisible uh, on our screen right there, but it felt like uh, Ray was saving it for the next game. Uh, something like that didn't necessarily work out as uh, Life also had a really good game. Uh, I think Life, Beatty, and Rascal all had uh, great games. Beatty was fantastic in game number one also but uh, still just uh, showing his world-class status as, uh, yeah, these last team fights, this is an example of Gen G, A, having an Ocean Soul, and B, just being better. Yeah. That is exactly what was happening inside of this game. And so now the, the question remains, after a game one and two of this kind of a manner between these two teams, what does game three have in store for us? And now DRX and T1 it's all coming down to this for both of those teams as Genji really want to get this win to clinch that first place spot. Yeah, this will mean that they can practice for so much longer and study their other teams for so much longer. Remember, this is 10-7. Uh, we still have a lot of evolution in the meta to happen here. And being able to watch and study and make sure you know exactly what's strong on this patch is going to be really important. It's, I think that was the first Moonlight Vigil that actually did anything this game. And uh, Aiming did do a lot of work with it, but unfortunately, it was as his Nexus was dying, so not quite able to get enough work done. As we have a look at our ruler in this team fight, he was uh, certainly holding on to his fate ball for a really long time and made sure that he mitigated all of the CC from the Galio with it. Really, really nice stuff uh, between him and Lion. Yeah. Them farming for kills. Yep, yeah, felt all too easy here for these guys as uh, yeah, Ray couldn't get on top of anyone. There was an army of minions, and uh, Ruler was able to just happily go and take them uh, 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 before winning the game. So, really clean stuff here. The emote spam was strong too. I mean, aiming did do some damage. 
But uh, in the end, it didn't actually matter at all what he was doing because an Ocean Soul is probably going to mitigate about 13k anyway. So yep. it doesn't even really matter. Well, that was game number two. Rascal having a very nice comeback here after the game number one performance. So we must yeah. be feeling pretty comfortable about that. And again, is KT going to make sub outs now going into three? We expect it, but we weren't expecting a, a sub out in general in game two. So we might just get surprised. Well, we'll see what the surprises are going to be as we move into game number three, guys. We have a short break, but then we'll be back with that. Don't go anywhere.